Ayush, I'm sure like a lot of people out there, mm -hmm. you and I thought that we had lots of time till December 30th, in fact. And like a lot of those people out there, we were all wrong. Yeah, to exchange the notes, that is. We're not talking about anything else. We're talking about exchanging those 500 and 1000 rupee notes, the old ones that were scrapped, essentially. And you know, it's interesting, Alex, because there's, if there's one word that can describe what's been going on, it's utter chaos. Absolutely. And we've been part of that chaos from we've day been, one. From day one. We've been looking at it from the outside. In fact, both of us haven't really had the time to go to the branches, and which is why we're having that conversation. We, we're wondering how to go to the bank and, and exchange those notes because it's no longer possible. As of yesterday, it was stopped. But that chaos wasn't really helped by the fact that over the course of these last two weeks, there's been a lot of flip-flop, right? There's been one notification here and then a change of that notification there. So people don't really know what to expect, right? Absolutely. I mean, just imagine the Aam Admi. For all the millions in India, how many of them actually know what the RBI is all about? Or what the Supreme Court is saying? Or what the other courts are saying? Or what kind, on what grounds are these, you know, all of these moves being challenged in courts, mm -hmm. right? So we need to de deconstruct that and really analyze that and figure out what on earth is happening. Absolutely. And whether or not there are some people who've questioned not necessarily the legality of the overall demonetization move, but the manner in which it has been carried out. Absolutely. Whether or not it was done in the right way, whether people were given enough time. There were obviously statements made by the government, by the Prime Minister, uh, about why they couldn't give people enough time. But that, in fact, is being argued in court as we speak. Because they didn't want to give them a whiff of what they're doing, because then all the hoarders would do just that. It, yes. it would defeat the purpose. But to understand those intricacies and, you know, the legality of it and the constitutionality of it, we will be joined by a legal expert. Yes. But before that, let's run the viewers through a quick timeline of all of these regulatory and policy flip-flops that we've all been sort of victim to. Yeah. Ayush, we've been actually looking about, we said that, we've been looking at demonetization. The fact was, you were in Delhi, I was here Absolutely. when it broke. We were told on November 8th, yeah. at around 8 o'clock, that effectively uh, 500 and 1000 rupee notes would no longer be legal tender. You could go to a bank branch and exchange the notes that you had in your, on your person for 4000 rupees. That was the initial curb that was placed on the amount that you could get in exchange for your old notes. And that led to all the chaos and frenzy because in those four hours, People, the, the, the messaging was all about, you know, the communication was that, hey, the common man thought that at 12 o'clock, my 500s and thousands are worth nothing. Yeah. It wasn't true because there was clearly a time frame given back then. Absolutely. And so what happened was chaos. We saw that the next day you saw it in Delhi. You weren't able to give your notes to anybody. Absolutely. You missed out on those, you know, uh, what was it? Milkshake. On the milkshakes. Yeah, That's you missed true. out on milkshakes. I did. I did. But, and then when I flew back to Bombay and we did a live show on yeah. the streets of Mumbai, yeah. which a lot of you guys watched, and we want you to comment just like that one because we might not be out in the streets of Mumbai, but we're here discussing, you know, what week two or week three. Yeah. And it's, it's an ongoing issue, guys. Yeah. So, but then what happened immediately after that chaos, Ayush, was that on the 11th of November, yeah. the RBI stepped in and said, look, you don't need to, you, you don't need to panic. There's lots of money that's already in circulation and we're well on course to uh, resupplying the money that's being pulled out. They said that you have 50 days, that yeah. is till December 30th, to exchange your notes and you will still get money back. But that should be the key takeaway, yeah. 50 days. So again, the psyche is and people who think I have 50 days to sort out my mess. Yeah. I, in fact, I know somebody who is setting aside a certain amount of money, Ayush. 1.25 lakhs, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. to buy a camera. Interesting. And she said, look, I'm going to hold on to this. I don't want to jump into the frenzy. I don't want to jump to the lines. Let me just wait for the things to cool down a little bit before I go to the bank and exchange my money. Now right. she can't. Now she can only go and deposit that money. On the 12th of November, in fact, the RBI went a step further to yeah. what they said on the 11th. And they said that beyond November uh, December 30th, which was the final date yeah. in which you could exchange money, you could actually go to an RBI branch, which you can still do. Which you can still do as of today. Yeah. Right? And well, we're going to come to today because there's a few more flip-flops on the yeah. way. But after that, also on November 13th, yeah. this was a little bit of respite yeah. and a little bit of relief. 
where you said, hey, you know what, that limit to exchange of 500,000 rupee notes was actually increased from uh, to 4,500 from, from 4,000 4, earlier. And that made all the difference in the world, right? I wish because at that point of time, people were roaming around with 10 rupees and 5 rupees in their pockets. Absolutely. And they were thinking, where do I get my next, you know, 100 rupee note? And that's from? also around, sometime around the time when the new 500 rupee yeah. note made its debut. Yeah. So, and after that, on the, on the 15th of November, if you, if you all remember, there was a whole issue of the indelible ink. That's oh. when, yeah, and that's when the government came in and said, look, if you want to exchange your money, if you want to go and deposit your old notes, you can only do it in one tranche. So if you have, you know, hundred th hundreds of thousands of notes that you have to deposit, you can only take it once, you get marked on your finger. I don't know how long that lasted. Well, it was, it was like getting them into election mode, wasn't it? Yes. But the objective was to ensure that people don't repeatedly enter the line to deposit their money. And then sub subsequent to that. Well, subsequent to that essentially yeah. was what happened last night. Yeah. The big no, bomb. No, in fact, on the 17th of November, that limit of 4,500 of course, was, was reduced, re reduced to, to 2,000 rupees. rupees. And even at that point, people really didn't they, think. They didn't think that you're going to completely scrap this altogether. Yeah. They still thought that you're gonna, you'd have that 50 day period, yeah. which is what was playing in everyone's minds. But it was brought down to 2000. Well, people didn't really question the rationale then and neither did we. Yeah. Because clearly there must be some, you know, restrictions and some, uh, you know, they compulsions. Were all about, they were all talking about the process of recalibration of ATMs. Printing more the money. Of money that was getting into the system. Absolutely. All of those things. Fair enough. And then the bombshell. Well, a week after that, on last night, we realize that all over-the-counter exchange has now come to an end. And guess what? What's uncanny is the deja vu situation because it was announced around 8 o'clock yeah. when we all heard and you were given four hours because effective midnight, well, this was the second surgical strike on black money. Absolutely. So, but it's important to point out here that you can still, and the RBI says that you can still go and deposit the old money yeah. that you have. So, it's only a curb on exchange of notes. So, instead of, but instead then, of standing in... You know, but then you also have you also have the government clarifying there through their spokespeople, uh, spokespersons that that essentially compels you to open a bank account. Exactly. So what what about uh, well, there's no exact figure because obviously there are a lot of Jandhan uh, accounts that have been created over the past year and a half, which have been a contentious issue by themselves Absolutely. in this whole black money battle. But there is still a large portion mm -hmm. of the population that continues to be unbanked. Absolutely. So, so it's it's a question of how the government was intending to carry out demonetization uh, for those people who don't have access to a bank account, who earn their wages in cash. You Which, know, it's it's and it's not a, a stretch of imagination to suggest that such people also had access to 500 notes, mm -hmm. because 500 notes back when the the earlier demonetization took place in 78. Is, yeah, in 78, and what it is now. I'm sure of course, there's a lot more cash a, in the system. There's a lot more cash in of the course, system. Of course. It accounted for, and, and I'm sure people would have heard that number by now, around 80, 84% of the entire currency in the system in terms of value. So that's the amount of currency that's in the system. So and it's, it's quite clear that it's possible that a lot of those people who are unbanked yeah. still had access. And, and that's where, that was the genesis of a lot of uh, public interest litigations uh, and a lot of people challenging this in different courts, be it Madras, Karnataka, Bombay High Court and even the Supreme Court. Yeah. And that's when you realize that the ones who've really done their research are not just questioning the numbers, yeah. they're also questioning how unfair this is, yes. how the method adopted perhaps, their questioning perhaps was not entirely legit. Absolutely. Right? And perhaps all of this chaos and crazy and frenzy could have been, you know, placated to a great extent. There, there were questions raised, for example, on how soon the RBI should have started printing, say, the 100 rupee note. Maybe, you know, if it had started a little earlier, to built up treasury. To really, to really avoid that cash crunch. Absolutely. But now, since we're talking about it, and there's been a law, there's been a hue and cry all over the media space over Twitter and Facebook, whether this whole thing was legal right? Whether the method was legal, was it constitutional? So to actually discuss, dissect and analyze that, we have with us a legal expert. We have Alok Prasanna Kumar. Alok is a visiting fellow at the Vidhi Center for Legal Policy. Alok, thank you so much for joining us on Bloomberg Quint. Thank you for having me, Alok. So Alok, when we talk about, you know, you've, you've been writing extensively on this and you've been researching on this, you've practiced 
uh, at the Supreme Court. So when it comes to the legality of such a move, if you could tell us whether that can be challenged at all in constitutional law, where, where someone's fundamental rights are at stake, can that be challenged at all? So there are two separate kinds of challenges when you're talking about. One is did the government have the power in the first place to do to make a move like this? If you recall, the last two times that demonetization happened, they had to pass an ordinance. But as this time, they've done it through just a notification. Some people have argued that they should have passed an ordinance and should have passed a law through parliament. I would say it's not absolutely necessary. The government was already given the power under the RBI Act to do so, and they have exercised this power under the RBI Act. The notifications themselves are not illegal, and there's nothing per se fundamentally wrong with demonetization. What can be taken issue with is what has happened afterwards. What has happened afterwards, possibly the way in which the government has mismanaged this exercise, possibly in the way in which there has been huge inconvenience, and I want to like use the word inconvenience, there's been a lot of trouble caused to a lot of people. Right. And the fact that it has disproportionately, uh, disproportionately impacted the poorer sections of society, I think also some serious introspection by the government may not necessarily be court intervention because the court also has very limited tools at its disposal. But I think some of the subsequent decisions, and specifically this topic of note exchange, is I think highly dubious legal. Okay, Alok, in fact, I want to point out here that, and this is something that's trending on social media, it's mm -hmm. something that happened yesterday. It's where the former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. He finally spoke up. He spoke up and yeah. he spoke up and, and did he and speak how? up? And how? Right? And the points that he raised, he started by saying that he didn't agree, uh, disagree with the objective of demonetization, the fact that it would curb black money, the fact that it would curb counterfeit currency, and it would work against terror finance. Absolutely. But he said that it was monumental mismanagement. In fact, that's exactly what you pointed out. And, yeah. he, and, and when he, he actually addressed those people that were defending demonetization, when he actually quoted John Maylord Keynes and he said, look, if you're saying this will all be okay in the long run, well, we'll all be dead run, in the long run. We'll all be dead. Yeah, absolutely. But yes. what, is, what was more interesting, and, and the, those are actually the points that you raised about inconvenience and the problems that were created, I want to actually understand whether that will be taken up uh, perhaps more strongly than the entire demonetization effort uh, per se about the fact that uh, a lot of people according to Prime Minister, uh, former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh have lost their lives. Over 65 yeah. people according to him have lost their lives on account of demonetization. Is that really a f the fact that economic growth could be affected according to and him? Absolutely. He says that it could, uh, the GDP could actually take a hit of 2%. Yeah, 2%. Yeah, so two percentage yeah. points is what he thinks, and he's saying that it, that is an underreported or underestimate, underestimate yeah. rather than an overestimate of what it is. So apart from and and also he's talked about the the percentage of India's labor force that's in the unorganized sector that's obviously getting very hugely impacted by this. He said that look, fifty days is not a very long time in the context of people living in urban areas, but 50 days is a lot of time for somebody who is a daily wage worker and that could in some cases prove to be a situation of life and death. So in that, will the court uh, take more cognizance of that fact rather than the demonetization effort per se? Yeah, I, I would think that's entirely possible given what the court has observed already so far. A lot of this will depend on the specific claims that are made by the lawyers and the litigants in these cases. The one issue that I have with the way the PIs have been filed is that they have been filed by lawyers, right? They have not been filed by people actually standing in lines, people per, per, per se affected. Now, they haven't, they aren't the ones who approach the court. So when the court hears, you know, a lawyer claiming to act in the public interest, saying, oh, people are affected, they'll say, sure, you show us their interest. But when somebody actually goes up to court and files an affidavit saying, look, I have lost 30 days' wages because of this. My family is on the verge of bankruptcy and starvation because of this. There's a completely different approach to this. So what we haven't seen litigation strategy wise is people who are directly affected by the monetization approaching court. You still had people allegedly allegedly, allegedly taking up their cause uh, their cause to the court, but nobody directly affected it by Coming in terms of what actually has happened to people, the court may look into it. But here's the difficulty with the court. The time frame is very short. They can't have very detailed hearings. They can't take the Supreme Court specifically, they can't take on evidence about a case. So somebody has said 
70 people have died because of demonetization, then like, that's all very good. But in court, we have to see how to draw the, co uh, the causal link. How do you say this particular decision of the government ultimately led to this person's death? You may have to prove it in court, but the Supreme Court is not the particular forum for that. So, at best, and here's what I think the court might do. They might say, look, you're causing genuine problems. Please consider doing X, Y, and Z to ease the situation. There is one specific thing that I think the court should do at the moment, and which is to continue uh, allowing exchanges over the counter. I'm saying this because the manner in which the exchanges have been stopped is patently illegal. Under the notification issued on November 8th, the government said exchanges will be valid till 30th. You could exchange your cash till December 30th. Till today, that particular notification has not been amended. All we are getting are RJ circulars, we are getting press releases, we are getting FAQs. But that unless that actual notification is amended to say why uh, to say that exchanges will be stopped with effect from this day, whatever is being done is being done illegally and without the authority of law. The difficulty, of course, is that everybody affected by this is standing in a queue somewhere trying to get their money. The second point that I have to make in the specific context of note exchange is that you gave people the belief that you have 50 days to exchange your notes. Mm. You created this desperate expectation that you are de you are demonetized, you are uh, demonetized 500 and 1000 rupee notes will still be good for use in so far as they are exchanged in banks. That you will not have to rush immediately to the bank to get it changed. So people took this as to mean Absolutely. that I have time to and I can wait till the crowds lessen. And now all of a sudden, with zero notice, you have gone ahead and said we will no longer exchange. This is, a, I think, a violation of the principle of legitimate expectation. Right. There is a, a court devolved principle called the doctrine of legitimate expectation. It was devolved in UK courts. Indian courts have used it. To say that the government cannot promise one thing today, expect people to act on it and take, obtain a benefit, and suddenly turn around and take away that benefit. Mm -hmm. like, and it's, it's not as if, as if people have been consulted, people were not made aware. They were not given an opportunity to. Uh, arrange their affairs so that they can, they're not adversely affected by this. And you're not talking about people have done something illegal. Yeah. I could have understood if you have said that we will not uh, allow exchanges beyond 5,000 rupees, fair enough, beyond 10,000, fair enough. You are affecting people who might you want to misuse this facility. But by completely stopping exchange, you are affecting directly the people who have done nothing wrong, who have taken the benefit of your own words to say that we have to believe that they have 50 days to actually change our laws. And now you suddenly have told them all your notes are worth this. This, I think, is no. fundamentally illegal. Ab absolutely. No, absolutely. I look and patenting illegality, doctrine of legitimate expectation. These things, I'm sure, will be argued in court because some of the top uh, constitutional lawyers are, are representing some of the parties in the cases as well. But what I wanted to ask you was, and this is interesting, because for someone to actually approach uh, the Supreme Court with uh, uh, under a writ petition or perhaps using a public interest litigation, those are the two ways you would approach the Supreme Court in a situation like this and yeah, they uh, what we have seen with the High Courts is what Madras High Court said that hey, you know what, demonetization, essentially what they said was that it's not a bad thing. So we are dismissing yeah. this petition on the face of it. Karnataka has also dismissed it. Bombay High Courts, you know, really not uh, uh, ruling in any way. And so what I wanted to ask you was this hands-off approach which courts yeah. have when it comes to matters of economic and fiscal policies, you know, yes. they don't want to encroach upon the domain perhaps of uh, the legislature or the executive. Do you yeah. think that that's a scary proposition because then what remedy am I left with as a citizen? Even if I'm a citizen going to the court, what remedy am I left with at the end of the day? Because it's all at the whim and fancy of the government then. So, so that's right and I think there's a larger question to be answered. Today we have a problem with demonetization. 25 years ago people had a problem with the whole liberalization policy. 20 years ago people had a problem with privatization of industries. 15 years ago people had a problem with Narega or whatever. The point is you don't want to stop the government from experimenting. That's what they have been put into office for. Right. People trust these guys that, for better or worse, they get their policies approximately right. When they get it wrong, it's not for the court to fix it. It's for us to stand in line every five years and say, guys, you really messed up. Yeah. Right. It's not for the court to say, you think we, should, we think you should have done B and not A. Yeah. If A is fundamentally illegal, sure, go ahead and strike it down. If uh, this is not allowed by the Constitution of India, sure, go ahead and strike it down. If some aspect of how you're doing demonetization is illegal, absolutely the courts should strike it off. But whether the government should do A or not do A, whether government should do A or B, is absolutely not the business of the court. Yeah. And I think it's quite dangerous for any democracy 
if the court is in the business of deciding larger economic and uh, uh, fiscal policy, it is just not capable of doing so. Okay, it's interesting, Alex. You know, this is an argument with something that Alok brought up because often, you know, courts are often accused of judicial overreach in these situations. So it's a very thin line between, you know, judicial activism and overreach. Uh, you know, what should judges do? What cases should they take up? What should they admit? These are genuine issues that plague in the judiciary. So I have a couple of points that I want to figure out. One, I want to ask uh, Alok, uh, could the government really come up with an uh, or, or a, a statement or an argument in this case? that it's not really stopping the deposits of 500,000 rupee notes. So take for example a situation where somebody had uh, one, 1 lakh rupees in the old currency and wanted to go to a bank and exchange over the counter. He would still receive according to the change in notifications 2,000 rupees, that's before 24th. Now he still has to deposit that 98,000 rupees. So it's not in that sense a big change. He would still have to stand in line at the withdrawal, uh, you know, for withdrawals to withdraw that twenty-four thousand rupees that was due to him. So, in that sense, yes, it's an increased inconvenience for that. No, but can I add a twist to that? Yeah. Alok, so in that scenario, taking what Alex just said, if I didn't have a bank account, yeah. you're compelling me to open a bank account. Well, is there any particular law really in this state? that actually compels me to have a bank account as we speak? No, there isn't. And this is an issue which actually the Supreme Court should have decided if they had heard the Aadhaar privacy case in the last Absolutely. one and a half years. Mm. This is an issue. Can the court, can the government compel you to do something in the context of getting a bank account or giving your biometric details? It's all very well for the government to make a theoretical argument that yes, you can still open a bank account and deposit the money and withdraw it. But the issue is that you're talking about 28 to 30 percent of the population who don't have a conservative. Yeah. 25 to 30 percent of the population who don't have access to a bank account. Banks are already overburdened in these two months that they can't do any other function apart from uh, the, 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 it's kind of uh, accepting deposits and exchanging them. And now you're putting citizens in a situation where their you know daily uh, life depends on being able to open a bank account. And we're talking about a second order problem. The first problem is that your money becomes worthless. Yes, you can possibly find other ways to make it legal. You could even give it to somebody who is willing to put it in their bank account. But the basic problem is this. How can you have confidence in a government which through a stroke of a pen wipes out all your assets? I'm not talking about the assets of the richest and the people who can manage this. I'm talking about the assets of the people who have nothing else but the notes in their hands. So how can the government do something like this first by a stroke of a pen and that too, by you know, saying that you no longer exchange notes. I mean, you could have uh, given more time, you could have allowed easier limits, something like that could have been done. But to completely say no exchange allowed, I think it's an extreme move. Uh, as far as the, the question of what the court should be doing with, with, in, in the context of somebody, say, uh, uh, the government makes an argument like this, the court has to look at the ground reality. That's a problem. That, that's one of the problems that you know, uh, jurisprudence in India, at least. Is very focused on courts going on principles, courts going on assumptions, courts going on presumption, and what the law says. They don't assess the rightness and the wrongness of an action of the government on what the impact on ground reality is. So they will look at a law and say, does this law discriminate or not? They will not look at what happens on the ground when this law is put into play. Is it disproportionately impacting some people more than the others simply by virtue of who they are? Now, this theory of disproportionate impact has been used in a lot of courts around the world. But somehow our Supreme Court has not really opened its eyes to the potential of how the government may, by saying something neutral in a law, tend to affect one section of society far more and to their detriment than the other section. So this is, it, it, it's fine for the government to make a legal claim like that, but I think the, what really the court should do is, please show us the data on how many people don't have bank accounts. Absolutely. Please tell us how many people don't have other uh, cards or any form of identity. Please tell us how many bank accounts have been opened in the last few months so that we know if it is possible for these people to at least open their bank accounts in the next few days and get things sorted out. So unless the government, uh, unless the court asks these questions, it will really be failing its duty in finding out what the impact of these measures are. So would, would it then be that far a stretch of the imagination to say that one, for the people that didn't have those bank accounts, mm -hmm. uh, would it be, uh, could you say then that the fundamental rights were violated, uh, violated in a sense? I, I would say a fundamental, okay, 
fundamental right is possible. That right? okay, that's the second order thing. Your fundamental right to livelihood may be affected. Your right to life may be affected. But a more basic constitutional right, your right to property has been affected. The, the, your notes are a liability which the government has. It's what the government owes you. You have you're owed so much because you have these notes. What the what RBI has done, not even the government. The government still says in its notification that you can exchange these notes. What RBI has overnight said is you can't exchange these. They have basically destroyed your right to property, your property, without any authority of law. I think that's the basic constitutional right that has been violated. So to that extent, yes, I think that especially this this stopping exchange is I think a direct violation. Even if the larger issue of whether withdrawal limits are okay or whether exchange limits are okay are all up for debate. I think this particular move is a straightforward violation of the right. But Alok, Ayush, I am the only one in this room who is not a lawyer, but I still happen to have read. at one case that is talked about i'm sure a lot the jayanti lal ratanchan shah versus the rbi where this yeah. very point was raised uh, the fact that it was unlawfully you know taking away Absolutely. property from the people but it was shot down by the by the supreme court so yes it was and here's the difference and this is why it makes a difference as to the manner in which it was done the legislation there it was an ordinance an yeah. ordinance which was later allowed, uh, passed by parliament they made a law and and it is perfectly acceptable to take away property with the authority of law the point is here the stopping of this exchange has been done on the basis of what nobody can point to a notification or a rule or a law which says so we just had this announcement i looked up the rbi website it still just says a uh, it still says a press release is written by so and so by somebody in the finance ministry the government hasn't yet come out with a proper yeah. notification amending the notification of 8th november saying exchanges will be stopped with effect from today and this is a point related to the rule of law i think this is and this is very interesting because when alok says this it's not just about constitutionality or a patent or latent illegality and stuff like that it comes down to two key questions it's what the common man thinks and even what a a, a legal mind would think would be that this is arbitrary mm. any and member of fair any and it's unfair Right so that's one question I want to pose to Alok just generally as a as a citizen yeah. of India that do you think that considering the number of people who are impacted by this and and the human angle there is to this that somewhere this has been either uh, you know unethical unfair or really immoral in any way So I I just just continue the thought that I was just saying uh I'm saying that this is a, this, this is this is where the, so the government has really damaged the rule of law in this country. Right. You can't be making up rules or laws or particulars on a as you go basis every day. It's really damaging for one the confidence in the government in this country. Right. Two the fact that nobody knows what the laws are as the common person in this country. I don't know what is permitted, what is not permitted, yeah. and if what is permitted and what is not permitted changes on a day to day basis. You, we can't call ourselves a rule of law country. if some an important measure like this is being implemented in such a slipshod and haphazard way so yes there is a level of arbitrariness yes there is a level of unfairness in the way certain specific measures have been undertaken you know again i come back to this exchange of the notes there is and this complete arbitrariness in the way of saying we'll accept notes for uh, uh, mobile recharges but not in ration shops <laughs> or we'll accept it in ration shops but not in convenience and the respect to the of the 1000 rupee note that was that is not going to be accepted and the 500 rupees no and also that those mobile recharges prepaid ones will be capped at 500 rupees exactly well. <laughs> so, and what what does it say it, it it says that you really don't know what you're doing as a government and that has serious implications for how you approach an important question like this if the attitude is whatever we say goes you are essentially reducing a democratic rule of law country to a autocratic dictatorship almost hmm. right it's today you're making one law tomorrow you're not even making a law you just somebody announces it and next thing you know it's being enforced that is not how a democracy or a rule of law or a constitutional democracy is supposed to work there are systems and institutions in place and if you can't follow them then there's something fundamentally wrong with the way this government is working Right. Interesting. Some very interesting points that Alok has raised uh, throughout the course of this conversation. Alok, thanks so much for joining us. We're going to be in touch with you uh, very soon, and we'll do a follow up as well. But thanks so much for joining us. You know, it's it's interesting that you know Alex Alok raised quite a few points and, and very very and strong points. Very strong India. points, and they and they were cogent arguments. But at the end of it, he spoke about India being a constitutional democracy. Yes. and one of the biggest ones out there right and it's it's timely that it's it's november 25th today yeah. tomorrow is november 26th it's a day that the prime minister 
uh, has, you know, has announced as Constitution Day for us. Yes. It's a day that we actually uphold and preserve our democratic ideals. And under the Constitution of India, Alex, India is a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic. Mm. And we can only hope that for many years to come, it stays that way. Absolutely. Let's wish everybody a good weekend. And here's to Constitution Day tomorrow.